Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Tuesday, June 11th. This is a major benefit for all people, irregardless of race, color, or creed. Barack Obama gets the all clear to build his presidential center in Jackson Park. Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton shares her take on this year's dramatic spring legislative session. And a local Cirque du Soleil performer tumbles back into Chicago and revisits his old high school. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paris Schutz. Here's what's making news in Chicago tonight. Chicago Public Schools is facing a federal lawsuit over alleged bullying of special needs kids. A group of parents and their attorneys say they also want Mayor Lightfoot and State's Attorney Kim Fox to investigate what they call a pervasive bullying problem in CPS. One fourth grader, Jamari Black, attempted suicide allegedly because of the bullying he endured at the hands of teachers and staff. He is now in the hospital on a respirator. The family's attorney says the tragedy has fallen on deaf ears. All of these people that are standing with me have filed complaints and notices and put the Chicago public school system on notice that this has got to stop. And we're here, unfortunately, in a federal lawsuit because it has not stopped. CPS in a statement says all allegations of bullying and student harm are taken seriously and there is no tolerance for adults who fail to protect students. The city could be one step closer to easing back on traffic and parking ticket fines. City Clerk Ana Valencia unveiled a report with 14 recommendations to making those pesky fees and fines a little more manageable to city residents. Among them, allow for a debt forgiveness program, also longer grace periods and better awareness of driving, parking and city sticker policies. Mayor Lightfoot applauded the effort and expressed her desire to move away from balancing the budget on what she calls a regressive ticketing system. And Chicagoans will have a new transit option in the coming days. Today, the city announced 10 companies that will receive permits to operate a pilot program for electric shared scooters. Those companies are Bird, Bolt, Groove, Jump, Lime, Lift, Sherpa, Spin, Veoride, and Wheels. The companies will be allowed to operate 250 scooters covering a 50 square mile zone on the city's west side. And if all goes well and it turns out to be safe, then the program could become permanent. As for the weather, a chance of showers and thunderstorms tonight, but otherwise mostly cloudy with a low around 61. Then tomorrow, more rain expected with a high of 71. Well, there's been controversy ever since former President Barack Obama announced he'd chosen Chicago for his presidential center. Will a court decision handed down today allow Obama and the city to move forward and finally build it? Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here with a story. Amanda. Paris, U.S. District Court Judge John Blakey previously had ruled that the group Protect Our Parks did have standing to bring this lawsuit seeking to stop the Obama Presidential Center from being built in Jackson Park, Park that is. But in short order today, just after hearing an hour of oral arguments, he dismissed that lawsuit, ruling that President Obama's twist on a presidential library can proceed without delay. We're thrilled. So this has been, the lawsuit is, was by a bunch of people who do not live on the south side. It's been a waste of our taxpayers' dollars. It's delayed construction. I'm bitterly disappointed, quite honestly, and I'm very surprised the decision came today. In a statement, the Obama Foundation's CEO expressed gratitude to everyone who believes in the project and says the foundation looks forward to moving forward arm in arm with the center's south side neighbor, saying, our vision for the Obama Presidential Center has always been one where the location reinforces the project's core aims, a celebration of history, a place of connection and engagement for the public, and an investment in our community. Amanda, remind viewers what this lawsuit was about in the first place. This wasn't over whether the center should be permitted to go in Chicago or not. It's a matter of where in the city. The Obamas had several options, but ultimately chose land along the lakefront in Jackson Park. Obama's foundation will pay Chicago 10 bucks to lease the land for just 99 years. Members of Protect Our Parks say that's a giveaway.
20 acres of Jackson Park land is worth multi, multi millions of dollars, perhaps a billion dollars. And they're giving exclusive use of possession of the property to the Obama Foundation, whereas it's completely open now to the general public. So it is unquestionably a massive giveaway. Protect Our Parks says the Obamas should leave the land in its natural state and put the center on private land to the west. The judge says a park doesn't have to be a nature preserve, and backers of the project agree. If you notice, all of our major museums are on the lakefront. The major public facilities that help to enhance our city. Some local residents who packed the courtroom to watch this morning's proceedings are celebrating as well. They say neighborhoods on the south side have been suffering from high unemployment, but that's already changing. At the announcement of the Obama Presidential Center, things started to change in our community. We are getting phone calls from investors that are interested in opening businesses there. Home sales has increased. We have three commercial corridor studies going on right now. People are interested and we are very excited about the economic growth and development that this Obama Presidential Center will bring to the South Shore and other surrounding communities. For all of us who live in the area, the Obama Center represents hope. Hope that we haven't had in the South Side for a long time. So hope that in fact our community can once again rise from the ashes. So Amanda, the judge said the Obama Center should go about its business immediately. Does that mean we're going to see the backhoes and the dump trucks in Jackson Park in the coming days? Not quite, Paris. The federal review process is still underway. Also, activists unsatisfied with today's decision say they do plan to appeal, hoping even for the U.S. Supreme Court to get involved. Because the impact of his ruling means that the city now can take any of the lakefront public parks and at its discretion turn it over to private entities for private purposes. While the local leaders we just heard from see the development and higher home values spurred by the center as a positive, other residents are wary it's going to make rent skyrocket to the point that they'll be forced to move. They want the Obama Foundation to enter into a formal community benefits agreement. They're seeking guaranteed low-income housing in the nearby area, a majority of contracts to go to minority-owned businesses, jobs set aside for local residents, including guaranteed jobs for youth, seniors, and former criminals. Now, the terms of the deal were finalized while Rahm Emanuel was still mayor, and of course, that's no longer the case. In a statement, his successor, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, called the judge's decision that Jackson Park can unequivocally be home to the center a significant step forward in this historic project and for the city. She says she's committed to ensuring that this community hub creates unprecedented cultural opportunities and economic growth on the south side. Lightfoot says she'll meet with community stakeholders and foundation staff to resolve what she called remaining issues. Now, other organizers, like members of the group Friends of the Park, a separate organization. They'd also wanted the center to be built on private land in the Washington Park community versus in an actual park that had been designed by vaunted landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. But it, if it must be in a park, they say that they want all of the green space and recreational amenities that the Obama Center will be displacing to be replaced. Amanda, thank you. And I want to remind viewers that we asked Mayor Lightfoot about her thoughts on a community benefits agreement, and they can go to the website to check out the full Mayor Lightfoot interview to find that answer. WTTW News. There you go. <laughs> and now to Carol Marine and Governor Pritzker's second in command. Carol. Paris, the just completed spring legislative session produced a slew of initiatives championed by Governor J.B. Pritzker. Recreational marijuana, expanding gambling, and new taxes and fees to fund infrastructure repairs. Here to talk about what Illinois can expect from those initiatives, the new state budget, and more is Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton. She is a former state representative from Chicago. Welcome back. Thank you, Carol. Chicago Glad to be here. So the governor called the budget that was passed historic. But in truth, isn't it just a return to business as usual with plenty of pork barrel projects and an end of contract pension sweetener for teachers? Well, first of all, we are so proud of what we've been able to accomplish this 
first legislation, uh, le legislative session of ours. Um, we said that we wanted to think, think big for the people of Illinois. We said that we wanted to get Springfield back on the track of working families, and that's what we did. So this balanced budget, which includes bipartisan support, making sure that we worked with the legislators who know their districts best. Um, this was an opportunity for everyone to come together and make sure that we get a budget passed, make sure that we can prioritize things like education and public safety and the things that the people of Illinois have said are so important to our state. And that's what we did. But, but you know what I'm saying, and you were down in Springfield as a lawmaker, so in that enormous, voluminous bill, are designations for money, but not clear what the, the project is in a legislator's district. There's an end of contract pension sweetener for teachers. Aren't those the things that got us in trouble? Well, one of the things that we did when we think about our uh, legislators is that they have an opportunity. They know their districts. They know what their districts need. And we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to really talk about and meet the needs of their districts. And so that's something that's important. Um, look, I was a legislator under a time where we went 736 days without a budget. And I think one of the things that the people of the state of Illinois have said to us loud and clear is we want to make sure that Springfield is working. We want to make sure that Springfield is working for the people, and that's what Governor Pritzker and I have prioritized. Governor Pritzker doesn't favor a Chicago casino too close to downtown, and he wants it to go to a community that perhaps was left out and left behind. But isn't downtown really the logical place? And for a, a community that has been left out, that may be a poor income community and it ends up being a poor tax. Well, one of the things that we certainly want to do is we want to follow the lead of the city council and Mayor Lightfoot who will, you know, have some ideas of where they think it's best in the city of Chicago. Um, I think what Governor Pritzker and I have always prioritized is making sure that communities all around our state that have been left out, and certainly as we think about a casino in Chicago, we want to make sure at least that communities can certainly benefit. Um, we'll keep looking at some of the ideas, and Governor Pritzker and I will continue to work with uh, the heads of uh, the leadership of the city of Chicago to make sure it's in the best possible place. We're very glad that this also means that money that would typically go to other states, some of our bordering states that do have casinos, we're glad that this will now mean that some of these, this revenue will stay in our state. And of course, this is an opportunity to create jobs, and that's something that we've heard is very important for every community around our state. Black entrepreneurs have some real worries that they're going to be left out in the recreational marijuana business that's going to go to bigger, whiter groups. How do you assure them that they're going to get a reasonable and proper piece of the pie? Well, it's something that Governor Pritzker and I have uh, prioritized when it comes to the legalization of adult use of cannabis. We've always said that while we're grateful that this will bring in some additional revenue into our state, this has never been just about revenues. This has been about equity. This has been an issue about social justice. So when I think about our legalization of adult use cannabis bill that was passed, um, I couldn't be prouder. Um, we have um, ensured that we will make sure that people can get their records expunged for low-level offenses. Um, that will open up people being able to get jobs and go to school and also be able to participate in this industry. Um, we made sure that uh, there's a, a mechanism to invest in communities that have been devastated by the war on drugs. And we've made sure that entrepreneurs of color will have access to capital and other resources to help them not only uh, start businesses in this industry but grow businesses in this industry. So when we look at what has happened in the totality of this legislation, uh, this is one of the most equity-centric pieces of legislation around adult use cannabis in the nation and we are very proud of it. People worked on this uh, legislation, by the way, for a number of years. Stakeholders, have been brought to the table. Stakeholders from all over the state uh, have participated and lent their voices to the conversation. We're really proud of, of the outcome. But you, in, I know that you're very interested in restorative justice and criminal justice, but in order to have your cannabis misdemeanor erased, you have to have had a very small amount. And as I read that bill, there are three quarters of a million cases that qualify, and it requires a pardon from the governor. Isn't that a pretty attenuated and difficult process? No, the way that it's been set up is for those with uh, zero to 30 grams on the conviction, those individuals will be 
what's, I would say, close to what's considered an automatic expungement in that uh, there's a recommendation that they're going to be identified by the Illinois State Police. Um, that's going to the Prisoner Review Board, and then all of them will be coming to the governor for his pardon. Um, then we have a different uh, second tier where it's, I think, up to 500 grams, 30 to 500 grams, where there's an additional process. Um, but like I said, the goal is to make sure that people can get their records expunged. We've included that portion, and in fact, the social justice aspect of this legislation is the priority here. Abortion is the question in Illinois. Is it going to become the abortion capital of the Midwest, given all that's happening in states around which are outlawing it? Well, as I always like to think about, as a woman and as the mother of daughters, um, I, I am so grateful that I'm in a state where we are working hard through the Reproductive Health Act and through Governor Pritzker's leadership to make sure that women's right to choose what's best for themselves is protected. Um, I certainly believe that I'm smart enough to decide for myself what's best for my own body and for my life and what kind of choices I want to make in terms of my economic future. And I believe that all women in our state are able to do that. So we have a state where we have really pushed forward. The Reproductive Health Act was passed. And as we see all around our country where there are states that are rolling back the ability for women to be able to choose for themselves what's best for themselves, it's a really dangerous time. And we have to make sure that we step up and if Illinois is going to be a beacon in this country to say that women should have the same rights as men to decide what's best for their bodies, then so be it. Lawmakers passed the first capital bill in years, but it's funded by a slew of taxes, including the gas tax and other fees. What does that mean for all the people who are already leaving Illinois? Won't more follow? What it means for the people of Illinois is that we are going to get to work repairing our roads and our bridges, our waterways, making sure that when we think about crumbling school buildings, public universities, hospitals, and other critical buildings, that these things can now start to get repaired. One of the first capital bills that we've had in over 10 years, and really longer than that when we consider um, what happened to the last capital bill and how it was gutted out. So this is an opportunity when we think about some of our rural communities and other communities that have never, or it's been some time rather, I won't say never, but it's been some time since, they, since they've had some real um, repairs to their infrastructure. This is the way that we're gonna make sure that we can continue with economic growth and development by making sure that our infrastructure is strong. So we have over a six year period of time where there's gonna be projects happening all around our state. And it's gonna make people stay, not leave? Well, I think it's going to make people stay because when you can build a business and grow a business because you have a strong infrastructure, that's something that's important for business growth and development. So this is something that's going to support our business community. It's going to support our communities that need roads and bridges to make sure uh, that we are not only just safe, but that we, have, that we are continuing to be the real economic hub that we can be. Lieutenant governors before you have learned that it was, for them anyway, a dead-end job. Dave O'Neill under Jim Thompson, Bob Kustra under Jim Edgar, Sheila Simon under Pat Quinn. What guarantees did you get from J.B. Pritzker that you're going to have a meaningful job for the next four years? Well, when we first sat down to meet and we're having conversations about my being his running mate, I said to him, look, I want to have a real substantive role both in the campaign but also in the administration. And to his credit, Governor Pritzker said, I wouldn't have it any other way. One of the first things he did, understanding my passion for criminal justice reform, is that he signed an executive order establishing the new Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative, which is housed under my office, and gives me the authority to convene every single state agency in the state to make sure that we can push through an equity lens, push for justice, equity, and opportunity for all Illinoisans. I'm the chair of the newly created Illinois Council on Women and Girls. I'm the chair of the Governor's Rural Affairs Council, and I have um, a significant role in making sure that as we think about policy making and the work that we're doing in our state, that I am working as the governor's partner in these endeavors. So uh, it's a partnership that I really appreciate. It's something that I said I was interested in, and the beauty of it is he was too. All right. Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, thank you very much for thank being so with much, us on Carol. Chicago Tonight. There's more on Chicago Tonight ahead, so stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. 
We have a tremendous source of untapped, efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Cirque du Soleil has visited Chicago every year since 1989. This year, for the first time, the internationally minded Circus of the Sun has a performer with local roots. Chicago Tonight recently met him when he returned to his old high school. Here's another look. At the Chicago Academy for the Arts, dance students prepare for an instructional visit by an alum. It's pretty amazing. It's very nostalgic. You know, it's, I walked into this dance studio and it, it has the exact same smell of 10 years ago. It's crazy. It smells like old wood and dust and, you know, it's, I love it. He was welcomed by his former teacher, Randy Duncan, chair of the school's dance department, who warmed up the students and Kevin. Kevin Beverly, uh, wow, this little redhead, he was absolutely something else. He always had a desire to be the best he could possibly be. And uh, we, I remember Kevin when um, he could not even do a split, let alone be able to do what he's doing today. Kevin was always a favorite when he was here. Randy asked if we, I could come in and teach a little bit of uh, this, this ending solo, contemporary dance solo that I do in Volta when, I'm, when I play the main character. Volta is the new show from Cirque du Soleil, the theatrical circus and entertainment company based in Montreal, Quebec. Kevin Beverly is the understudy for the main role. He also dances and performs as a so-called shape diver. His interest in acrobatics began in his hometown, Grays Lake, Illinois, north of Chicago. When I was a kid, I started in gymnastics, and so I did gymnastics for a couple years competing, and I had one of my close friends in gymnastics that switched to dance, so I, com I followed him along in that pathway. It was really hard, you know, two hours of ballet every single day, and it was a pretty intense schedule, but at the same time that I came to this school, which was 2006, I started taking circus classes in Evanston at the Actors' Gymnasium, and after my first class that I had, I knew that this is for sure what I wanted to do. For the past two years, he has been one of 42 artists from 19 countries who appear in Volta, which blends extreme sports and acrobatics with eye-catching costumes and visual spectacle. All of it is linked by the story of a free spirit who tries to find his place among like-minded companions. Back at the academy, a pair of French-Canadian performers wow the students with feats of strength and balance. I saw Cirque du Soleil on TV, and that was a big eye-opener for me. It was like, oh, there's the dance, there's the circus, there's the flips, there's the theater. It had one big ball of like creativity that I was like, this it totally, I got really excited watching it. So I, uh, it was my first inspiration. And then from there, I definitely saw a bunch of shows live, and it, it just kept growing and growing and growing. Step under it, then the tour. Now the first local person to join a touring Cirque du Soleil team is ready for his homecoming. It's a feeling of full circle that I left Chicago 10 years ago uh, to chase this dream, and now I get to come back and I get to share it with my people, with my Chicagoland people, which is, I think, such a beautiful thing. I am so incredibly proud of, uh, of Kevin and uh, coming from the Chicago Academy for the Arts and knowing that there's somebody out there who has uh, reached this height in his career just makes such a huge difference for kids who are looking to do the same thing. For the first time, Cirque du Soleil is on the Soldier Field campus where the Big Top is in the South parking lot. Volta runs through July 6th and there's more to see on our website. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up.
Beautiful setting that is. And that's our show for this Tuesday night, abbreviated so we could bring you special pledge programming. And don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com news. You can also watch via podcasts in the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night, live at 7. The story of R. Kelly and years of alleged abuse as told by the reporter who's been covering the Chicago singer for decades. And a modest house in DuPage County contains frontier artwork and secrets of the Underground Railroad. We leave you now with a touch of summer fun, at least for the dogs on the beach playing around. So for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Well, we gave you a preview there. Now for the real thing. Good evening. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.